really nice to be here with all of you namaste namaste the highest in me bows to the highest in you all right so vasanthi first of all i really enjoyed listening to you 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 have a, a soulful and heartful voice and uh, Uh, we were all sitting in a corner chatting and normally when mic tests and all happen no one's ever listening <laughs> but you did a very nice mic test where we all felt drawn in and i'm sure other people also were talking to each other stopped what they were doing and began listening to you and what you said about the power of not only speaking but speaking from kindness and the energy that that has and i think everybody everybody here today we've had moments in our life when someone spoke to us and we could feel the kindness behind what they said and that is what was transformational for us so i'm very happy to be here i like to start my sessions <clears throat> with the sound of my singing bowl some of you may have seen this tibetan singing bowl my friend kumaran was sitting next to me was sitting there he said nitya you haven't changed huh? still singing bowl <laughs> because uh, i love the sound of this bowl and just yesterday i was reading a book about uh, communication and it said one of the first things that is important for communication to take place is matching and what matching means is that we begin to match at all kinds of level that we're not even consciously aware of like for example all of us now as we are tuning in whether you realize it or not our brain waves will start to match our heart rhythm will start to match even the electromagnetic whatever it's called skin resonance there's a word for it that will also start to match the more in the more aligned we are the more we will match and the more we will match the more fulfilled connected and happy we will feel and this bowl is one way to create that matching so just enjoy the sound of my bowl and with that we will go further So I feel like starting by honoring the impulse which is behind this festival there is something that moved Mahima and through Mahima moved other people around her and then many volunteers came together many sponsors came together many speakers came together the audience is here everyone is coming together and I want to honor that original impulse that's behind all of this so bowing down to that impulse there is a tremendous intelligence in such things that we humans don't always fully understand and we humans of course have ideas about how things should be should go what is success what is not success uh, but my understanding is that we shouldn't fall for that trap don't don't be fooled by the surface level of things and my teacher said to me that you know when you're meditating and you think nothing is happening that's when the most is happening and when you think you're progressing and all kinds of things are happening that's your spiritual ego <laughs> that's you're getting you're getting you're making assumptions about where you are and all of that but when you think nothing is happening that's when the most is happening so the impulse that i come from just like we have an impulse that led to this creation of this gathering this event this festival the impulse behind what i do is may i be a channel of blessings for someone today may i be the clearest possible channel of the highest possible blessings in the world and may all of us in our own ways may we be channels of blessings in the world everybody in this room everybody in the city everybody in this world is carrying a hidden burden you can't always see it with your eyes some of us are masters at hiding our burdens but everyone is carrying a burden and as we go through life we have a choice am i going to add to people's burden or am i going to lighten their load so one of my one of the books i read this person said i made a commitment to myself long time back 
that everyone who meets me should leave feeling lighter than before, better than before, or the same as before, but not worse than before. Everyone who meets me should leave feeling lighter than before, brighter than before, or the same as before, but not worse than before. In other words, I don't want to add to their load. And of course, no one's perfect, so once in a while, we're all going to mess up. But that's a good intention. It's a good operating intention. Can I live my life in a way that I'm not adding to the burdens of others? Today, I want to introduce a concept which is very similar to the theme of what we are exploring in this festival. The concept is called kindfulness. You heard the word mindfulness, but this is called kindfulness. And that K makes a big difference. In my own journey, you know, I began meditating. I was quite young. I was 16 years old when I began meditating. And uh, it was difficult, but I liked it. And I found it made a difference. But I remember having a bit of a, what you say, militant, that, you know, I should meditate for so many minutes a day. You know, I should be aware throughout the day. I should, I should. There was a kind of a should energy to it. It was more like, you know, that if I do this, then my life will be better. And a very big shift happened when I realized it's not about being mindful. It's about enjoying being mindful. It's about enjoy, don't, don't just be present, enjoy being present. Don't just do things, enjoy doing things. I'm sure everyone in the audience has at one point in their life gone to some kind of museum, some kind of art gallery. And typically there's so many paintings, so many sculptures, so many things to see. And usually you don't spend the same amount of time on everything. You will spend more time on some and less time on some. And then the question is, why did you spend more time with that painting and less time with that painting? And chances are you'll have a hard time explaining it. And all you can say is, I don't know, I just, I just liked it. I just, I just felt connected to it. I was intrigued by it. In other words, it captured your attention. So when something captures your attention, you like something, it's easy to be with it. If you like the present moment, it'll be easier to be in the present moment. If you don't like the present moment, it'll be very hard to be in the present moment. All the techniques you can learn in the world, you'll not be able to do it. Yesterday I was reading a book called The Mandala of Being. And this person who's a long-time meditator, long-time practitioner, he says that while I have meditated for many years, I've taught retreats and everything, and I have touched exquisite states of being, my real question was, why do I struggle to maintain this? In a retreat center, when I'm teaching, it's very easy. But why do I struggle to maintain this for the rest of my life? Why doesn't that happen? I think some of you are nodding your head, so you can, you can tune into what I'm saying. Not that you've never had these experiences, you have. But the question is, why in my normal life, it's not happening, it's not, it's not coming through? So his insight was that there are actually only four places our mind goes away from the now. There are four main places it goes. And he made a mandala. You know, mandala is, you, we have like a yantra or a mandala. He made a mandala out of it. So right at the center of it is that now. So this moment here, now. Present experience. Right at the center is now. And then just imagine, you know, I haven't prepared any slides. I did prepare slides, but I just want to speak to all of you. So now imagine this mandala. The right in the middle is now. Above is the future. Below is the past. So these are two. This is one spectrum, right? So as you're here with me also now, you're not always with me. Sometimes you're wondering what's happening next. Sometimes you're wondering what happened a little while back or yesterday or sometime in my life. So this is one place we go up and down. This is one thing that takes us away from the now. And the other thing that takes us away from the now, the left and the right. This is subjective experience, sense of me, self, and outer experience. You could call it objective, but it's more like objects. It's never really fully objective. Objects. So, subject, object, right? So, my sense of you or things. So, inner experience, outer experience, environmental awareness. Thoughts, and I, actually it's thoughts. Thoughts about my inner experience. Thoughts about who I am. And thoughts about who you are. So, check if it's true. This is, these are the only four places you're actually going. And some variation of these four. It's future or past. It's attention some kind of commentary on your inner experience or some kind of commentary on the outer experience. The more we are focused outward and on past and future, the more we are going to find life gets heavy, life gets dense, life gets dense. And there seem to be infinite 
things to do, infinite contradictions, conflicting roles and responsibilities, clashes within yourself and clashes with the people around you. And the more we start orienting ourselves to the center, the middle, the now, which is not some mystical place. This is the most, this is the only real place actually. Everything else is your imagination. My teacher Nisargadar Maharaj used to say, nothing can trouble you but your imagination. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. Nothing troubles me but my imagination. You know, I had a chance to live with a monk for six years. Vasanti read out my, you know, introduction. For six years I lived with a monk. Being a monk is in some way being like being in a laboratory. Because nowadays, you know, monks live in monasteries. Back in the day they would move around. But nowadays they live in monasteries. In monasteries it's a very, pretty set routine. You wake up at a certain time. You have a meal at a certain time. You're with the same 15, 20 people. Or if it's a bigger monastery, more people. It's pretty set in many ways. And this is a very good laboratory to do an experiment. Because in normal life, most of us, we are meeting so many people, we are doing so many things. You know, some of you are very active, different responsibilities, different gatherings, different events. And then there can be an, a feeling that, oh, because of that person, because that didn't go the way I want, because I missed my flight, because this happened, that's why I'm unhappy. But in a monastery, you get to realize, same routine, same people, similar food, similar things you're doing, but one day I'm feeling so grateful, so happy, so like this is the best place in the world, I'm the luckiest person in the world, what, a, what an amazing opportunity. And the next day it's like, this is all a big, everyone's fake. <laughs> everyone's pretending. <laughs> no one's doing anything real over here, right? And a sense of this practice doesn't work, this tradition is wrong, I'm wrong. In my case, it was mostly, I'm wrong. I'm not doing it right. Something, we all have different ways of focusing. Some focus outward, some focus inward. I would direct my energy of uh, comparison, judgment, resentment inward. I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. It's some version of that, isn't it? So in the monastery I realized that in the present moment there is never any problem. For six years I did this experiment. I asked myself, what's wrong with right now? Precisely now. What's wrong with right now? And I can tell you in those six years, I couldn't find a single time when there was anything wrong with the precise now. And that does not mean I did not have difficulties. I lived in deep forests. There were times I was, my leg was covered in leeches. There were times when, uh, you know, I was sick. I had uh, chicken pox once. Uh, there, were, there were many. There were, there were, even, even monks, believe it or not, have conflicts. The Buddha said that uh, householders fight over belongings, possessions. Spiritual people fight over ditti. What are ditti? Viewpoints. <laughs> so monks don't fight over things so much. They fight over viewpoints. My viewpoint is superior to your viewpoint. My way of seeing things is correct. Your way of seeing things is wrong. <laughs> There's a fun story about this. That these two monks are having an argument about some topic. And they said, you're wrong, you're wrong. So finally they said, let's go talk to the teacher. So the teacher lived in a small hut. right? So both of them couldn't go in together. First one said, I'll go and ask. So he goes inside, he bows down. The teacher, he said this, I said this. He's completely wrong. I'm completely right. Isn't that true? And the teacher smiled and said, you're right. We're very happy. He comes out. The teacher said, I'm right. I told you you're wrong. He said, how can that be? You wait over here. He goes inside. He bows down. Teacher, he said this. I said this. Everything he said is completely not based on any fact. What I've said is so logical, so consistent. I'm right, isn't it? And the teacher smiles and says, you're right. <laughs> So now he comes out, the teacher told me, I'm right. What are you talking about? So now they somehow both squeeze into the small little hut. The teacher will be very confused. You told me also I'm right. You told him also I'm right. Yeah, he's right. But we're both saying opposite thing. How can it be? We can't both be right. So teacher has a big, bigger smile and he says, you're right. <laughs> this is wisdom. Knowledge is a point of view. Wisdom is a viewing point. From the now you have access to infinite, infinite viewing points. Anywhere else on the mandala, you're bound to have a point of view. And a point of view will be a sense of, it is like this. It appears like this, and it feels like this, and therefore it is like this. But that's a point of view. I'm sitting here on the stage. You're all listening where you're listening from. You have your point of view, I have my point of view. But neither of our points of, points of view is complete. There is a totality which includes my point of view, your point of view, an ant on the wall, that point of view, and every other possible point of view, that is totality. 
that is totality and that is the point of view which will quench us nothing less than that but that requires a kind of stretching of who we think we are and what we think we are that goes beyond what we can imagine the whole process of spirituality is stretching yourself in two directions actually neti neti i am not this i am not this i am not this everything i thought i was i am not this i am not this i am not this this is one powerful direction neti 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 and the other powerful direction is iti 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 i am also this i am also this i am also this i am also this so one takes you towards the recognition i am nothing one one takes you to the recognition of i am everything and what's beautiful is you even honor the shell that remains of i am something so when you call me nitya shanti i will still respond because there is still the shell that responds but more and more that shell is becoming transparent thin transparent thin and there's less and less drama there there's less and less reactivity there i like to say you go from drama to dharma <laughs> that's for sure that happens right and so as it becomes more transparent i become a channel of blessings not because i am special because i just am and the i amness in me shakes and wakes up the i amness in you and this whole journey can become so much smoother so much nicer if you add the k to the m the kindfulness to the mindfulness it really becomes beautiful you enjoy the whole process goenka ji one of my teachers sm goenka he was teaching the first large meditation course in tihar jail there's a documentary on it you can watch it on youtube it's called doing time doing vipassana and uh, when i was part of the vipassana tradition we would share this documentary with people so the 1000 prisoner meditation camp had never been held anywhere in india or anywhere in the world it's a huge security risk to have 1000 prisoners without you know no matter how many uh, uh, pr- uh, police people you have you can't control 1000 prisoners if they, if they decide to go rogue right it's a huge security risk but they said let's do it and so goenka ji comes to the meditation tihar jail it's the one or two days before the course is going to begin and some prisoners are curious so they gather the courage to go up to him and say what is this course about we are all attending but we don't know what it is about yahan par kya hoga so i'll say it in hindi first and i'll translate so goenka ji says tapna hoga तपना होगा बहुत सुख से बहुत सुख से वो तो तपना होगा यू विल हैव टू बर्न देर विल बी अ बर्निंग दैट हैपेंस देर विल बी अ प्योरिफिकेशन दैट हैपेंस एंड देन ही सेज ही स्माइल एंड सेज बहुत सुख से डू इट विथ एंजॉय द प्रोसेस डू इट विथ जॉय राइट सो इट्स लाइक दैट अगरबत्ती दैट्स बर्निंग एंड इवन इन इट्स बर्निंग इट इज रिलीजिंग अ फ्रेग्रेंस so whether you like it or not believe it or not accept it or not tapna hoga in this lifetime you will go through a burning process because any time you are even a micro millimeter away from the center of the mandala you are in the world of the matrix you are in the world of illusion right and that's all right we will be on all kind of points of this matrix all all kind of points on the mandala and it's always feedback come home come home come home So I'm going to give you a five-step process to come home, practicing kindfulness with yourself and the other people in your life. Once you've learned the five steps, you don't even have to. Even the five steps is sometimes too much. But once you've learned it, you can even forget the five steps. It's all right. You will get the essence of what I'm talking about. All right. And it's very simple. It's very gentle. Sometimes even if you don't go to step five, you only go with step one or step two. Sometimes even that's enough. So let's just do it together. Are we ready? Yeah. step 1 or you want to call it stage 1 come to the present moment come to the present moment to come to the present moment you have to say goodbye to two things you have to say goodbye to the weight of the past and the weight of the future because those two things are not allowed in the present moment so step 1 stage 1 let your eyes be open also if you want come to the present when you come to the present you see things more clearly you hear things more clearly you feel things more clearly it's actually quite nice 
the present moment is quite nice. I'm imagining I have to be somewhere, achieve something. But could it be that what I'm looking for is already here? I just never noticed. Could it be like that time when you were wandering around the phone asking people, where's my phone, where's my phone? And they're very confused because you're talking on the phone. <laughs> Where are my glasses, where are my glasses? And they're very confused because the glasses are on your head. Or you're wearing your glasses. What's wrong with you? You're wearing your glasses. What you're looking for, could it be that you already have it? This is stage one. Come to the present. And one of the secrets to coming to the present is decide to enjoy what is happening. Instead of I should be in the present, I enjoy being in the present. So now let's go to stage two. In stage two, now you notice this is not really uh, climbing up a ladder. This is more like going inside each experience. It's like more like a lotus unfurling, unfolding, blossoming, right? The lotus has, each layer has more delicate petals, more beautiful petals, more soft petals. So now we're going one layer inside. So I'm going to call this, first one was come to the present. Second, I'm going to call silent present moment awareness. Because even in the present, there's a commentary going on. Very quiet. It's going on in the background. Some commentary is going on. Okay, now what is this about? Do I like this? Do I not like this? So in stage one, we put down the weight of the past. We put down the weight of the future. In stage two, we even press that mute button on the incessant commentary. And the way I do this is, I tell myself, Nitya, thinking is not required right now. And sometimes I'm shaving and my th thoughts are going on. I'm like, Nitya, thinking is not required. Just shave right now. It's okay. <laughs> when shaving, just shave. When eating, just eat. When walking, just walk. At every moment of your life, thinking is not required. You don't have to have a constant inner commentary. So once in a while, remind yourself of that and press the mute button. Say, alright, let me just, if I'm eating, let me just eat. If I'm walking, let me just walk. If I'm feeling, let me just feel. If I'm listening, let me just listen. Without adding a layer of my likes and dislikes and opinion on it. This is stage two. Can you give yourself a glimpse of what it's like to be silent. Silence does not mean no thoughts. It means not believing your thoughts. Not getting captivated, hypnotized by your thoughts. So try this with me. My grandfather was a journalist and he was, uh, he was very fond of Jiddu Krishnamurti. I don't know if you heard of Jiddu Krishnamurti. Krishnamurti also has a center here in Chennai. And when I told him I want to go for a meditation course, he says, you know, you read Krishnamurti, that's better. Don't go for the meditation course. So he gave me a book of Krishnamurtis. And I began reading it and I honestly did not like it. <laughs> he said, this Krishnamurti fellow is finding something wrong with everybody. And he has nothing to give of his own. He's finding something wrong with religion. He's finding something wrong with education. Finding something wrong with society. But what do you have to give, old man? So I literally felt that he's just a ranting person. And I said, what is this book my grandfather has given me? So I put the book aside. I went for this Vipassana course. I was 16 years old, 17 years old. And a few months later, I pick up this book again. And when I read those pages, I have tears in my eyes. The first time I read it, I read it with my thoughts and opinions. The second time I read it, I read it from the similar consciousness that Krishnamurti was saying it or writing it. There was a measure of silence. And silence recognize silence. So when you read the Gita, when you read the Upanishads, when you read the Quran, Bible, there is the outer layer, which is just the words and concept, but there's a layer below that. In fact, there are many layers, but there's at least one important layer below that, which is the layer of read it, look past the words, look at what the words are pointing to, don't get hung up in the words. Nusakdar like Maharaj said, you will never understand the Gita as long as you are reading it from the perspective of Arjun. 
you will never get it. He said, you will only understand the Gita when you read it from the perspective of Krishna. Read the Gita as though you are Krishna. In other words, read it from the middle of the mandala, not from the side of the mandala. Read it from the space that Krishna is sharing it from. Stage two. Stage one is come to the present. Stage two is silent present moment awareness. Let's come to stage three. By the way, at any point, if this is seeming too subtle, just stay with the previous stages, right? One thing I've learned is uh, don't pretend yourself beyond your evolution. <laughs> so if you're a tiny tree, remain a tiny tree. Enjoy being a tiny tree. If you're a big tree, enjoy being a big tree. The big tree is going to again become a tiny tree again. It's a cycle, right? So you'll find at some point in these five stages, you will find, ah, that's exactly where I, at this point in my life, this is exactly where I need to be. And don't feel that, oh, I need to be somewhere else. This is the big mistake we make. We imagine we need to be somewhere other than where we are, even spiritually. If you've read the book uh, by Herman Hess, what's it called? Siddhartha, yeah, Siddhartha. If you haven't read the book, the small little book, you should read it. This man embraces himself the way he is. And that becomes his straight path to awakening. His other friend becomes a monk. He doesn't become a monk. He become a become the boatman. Anyway, that's another story. So stage three, silent present moment awareness of one thing. Until now there was diversity. I was aware of many things in the present. And just a simple one could just be your breath. It could be anything actually, any one thing. But the simple one is our breath because our breath is always with us. The moment I said breath, we began to become aware of the breath. Some people get very technical. You should be aware of the breath on the nose, on the belly, over here. No need to get technical. Just be aware of the breath wherever it feels comfortable. Feels comfortable in the belly. Feels com comfortable in the nostrils, in the chest. Be aware of the breath. Enjoy the breath. I used to get very angry when I was a kid. And uh, I even sometimes, if, I used to be very finicky about food. So if the food wasn't to my liking, I would, I have sometimes thrown the plate of food. That's how angry I would get, which is just my incapacity to stay with my feelings. But when I learned this process of being with my breath, I would notice my thoughts racing. I would notice my emotions reflecting how my thoughts were racing. And I would come to my breath. And being with your breath is like putting brakes on a train. Train, if you notice, doesn't stop instantly. But if you keep putting brakes, little by little, you pulsate the brakes. No matter how long the train is, soon enough it will stop. And so I noticed my train of anger, which used to go for hours, began to go for minutes, began to go for seconds. And honestly, now it is rare. It's not that I never get angry. It's rare that I get angry. And when I do get angry, I don't see it as a failure. I see it as a precious gift. There is some expectation I have from myself, from the other, from life, which is not getting met. And instead of demanding that I should be different, you should be different, life should be different, I check, is it really true? What I'm believing, is it really true? Or is this something I've picked up along the way? Is it universal truth? Or is it made up, socially agreed on conventions? That's my process. And the breath helps me with that. So now come to stage three. Silent, present moment awareness of one thing, which in this case could be the breath. Let's come to the fourth stage as well, which is similar to the third one. Silent, present moment awareness of the full breath. So from beginning to end. Even in the breath, there were little tiny gaps because within one breath, you can go to the US and come back in your mind. But now you reduce that fluctuation as well. So can you be aware of the complete breath, full sustained attention on the breath? You're beginning to enter a new world, a world of kindfulness, a world of balance, a world of exquisite attention.
and you add a simple perception to your experience, you add the perception of beauty. What is beauty? Beauty is seeing something whole, something pure, something balanced, something clean, something natural, something deeper behind your experience. So can you experience your breath not just as air going through my body, but as something deeper than that, more beautiful than that? This is the thread that sustains you. This is what connects you to life. This is life. So it becomes a beautiful breath. In the fourth stage, <clears throat> in the fourth stage, we go from breath to beautiful breath. In the last stage, fifth stage, there is only beauty. The attention is no longer on breath, although breath may be happening. It's just the quality of beauty. Sundaram, Sundaram, Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram. Satyam is it's true. Shivam, it's good, it's beneficial, auspicious. And Sundaram, it's beautiful, it's so beautiful. The beauty in me bows to the beauty in you. The timeless, shapeless, limitless beauty in me recognizes the timeless, shapeless, limitless beauty in you. What you see in me, you evoke in me, you bring out in me, what I see in you, I evoke in you, I bring out in you. So to summarize, the five steps of this journey began with coming to the present, which means putting down the way to the past, way to the future. Silent present moment awareness. Putting down the weight of the inner commentary, even momentarily. It doesn't have to be perfect inner silence, just a glimpse is enough to make you realize, oh, there's something deeper here. And then coming to one simple thing like the breath or in, in, in your normal life, whatever you're doing, just do one thing at a time. You can't always do one thing at a time, but find, I would say structure your life in a way that you have more and more opportunities to do one thing at a time. That's when you'll have maximum satisfaction, enjoyment and meaning, which are the three aspects of happiness. So when gardening, just garden. When cooking, just cook. When eating, just eat. When walking, just walk. Reduce your multitasking is the same as reducing your unhappiness your dilution of being. And I promise you, you may do less sometimes, but you will enjoy it more. And the quality will be so much higher. And the fulfillment will be so much higher. And then start moving from mindfulness into samadhi, which is sustain your attention. There's a beautiful Greek word, meraki. Meraki means don't just do things, pour yourself into what you do. Can you sense how I am pouring myself into this talk? Can you sense that? I'm really giving air, all the love I have, all the energy I have, all the wisdom I have. I'm not leaving anything back. I'm pouring myself. So at the end of this, there will be no residue. I will not have a sense of what a great talk I gave, what will happen. It doesn't matter. It's complete. In the doing of it, it's complete. Now, whether you remember it or not, practice it or not, uh, appreciate me or not, it doesn't matter. Because Miraki is, in the process itself, there is fulfillment. In the doing of it itself, there is completion. Purnamada, Purnamidam. From completeness comes completeness. And as you are giving your full attention to your breath or whatever you are doing, you get in touch with beauty, with truth, with inherent goodness and perfection, Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram. Finally, even the activity doesn't matter. 
the breath doesn't matter, the object of meditation or attention doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter what you're doing. You could be cleaning toilets. You could be greeting dignitaries of a foreign country. It really doesn't matter. You are a secret agent of God. You are a secret agent of life. You are an avatar in disguise. You show up wherever you are. You do whatever that life is asking from you. And as it's done, it's complete. What's done is complete. A profound shift has happened from karma to dharma. Do your best in dharma. Leave the rest to karma. The wheel will turn it round. True peace will be found. Whatever you know you have to do, you need to do, do it. Do it with love. Do it with miraki. Do it with kindfulness. Add kindness to your mindfulness. Which means be loving towards yourself and others. And by the way, loving is not always giving yourself what you want and giving others what they want. Love can sometimes be challenging. So kindness is not only the feminine, compassionate kindness. There is a warrior kindness. There is a kindness of a coach. There is this fatherly kindness as well sometimes. But we have to check where it's coming from. If it's coming from resentment, anger, revenge, I'll teach that person, it's going to create tremendous havoc. But if it's coming from genuinely, I see greater potential in you. And I'm not going to settle for anything less then you're full blossoming. Then this kindness will work through you and truly you and I and all of us together will be channels of blessing in this world. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. And I hand it back to the organizers. Please continue from here. Looking forward to meeting you all.